afternoon, everyone. This is a setup. You know, you're well into the you're well into the conference, and so you've heard so much, so many good things. So, my expectations are about here for you to retain much of today's talk. But you know what? That's okay. I'm glad you decided to join us, to join me, uh, in what I would like to consider a, a, a bit of an exploration around um, healthcare justice. I'm my name is Ernest Gray, and I have the privilege of serving <clears throat> as the spiritual care director at Lawndale Christian Health Center. What that means is that I have the chance to keep Christian in Lawndale, and I have the chance to share uh, the good news of Jesus uh, with staff and patients. And so that's just the short story. Um, but I'm also in recovery from a couple of different prior jobs. I was a former pastor, uh, so I still like to think of myself as like a community pastor in the clinic, but we're no, we're, we are not in short supply of pastors at the clinic at all. No, we've got several. And so, uh, and then also a former academic. So in my prior life, I also taught a little bit at a Bible college in Chicago called Moody. And so I'm just figuring this out as we go. And so, you know, I'm a verbal processor. So if you mind, this, 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 this talk is a bit of me processing uh, what I like to think out loud and what I'm exper experiencing at Lawndale and for the last year and five months. But before we go anywhere, would you pray with me? Eternal God, our Father, we thank you that you have, you didn't abandon us and leave us to our own devices on the earth. We're not marooned, you sent Jesus. And you sent him to ransom us, to redeem us from ourselves. In that recovery ministry, in that ministry of reconciliation that you gave to us through your son, God, we are in this room learning and leaning on you to help us serve others. God, I, I acknowledge my um, frailty. I acknowledge um, that without you, I can't do anything, let alone share anything that is of a benefit to those here. So God, I pray that you would stand in my body, think my mind, use my tongue, if you will, uh, so that I can share some truths that I'm wrestling with uh, in real time. <clears throat> so thank you for this time, and thank you for those that are here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. How Jesus makes the vulnerable visible, what I like to think about in this moment is, uh, is how Jesus presents himself uh, to the world and what he cared about, right? If Jesus had a ministry of centering people who were left out, looked over, left behind, and he made them a priority in his life, then it seems to me I should do the same. Now, I haven't always thought in this terms because I thought that I was a part of a Constantinian Christianity. What do you mean by that, Gray? I mean like this kind of Christianity that in this name you will conquer, particularly in the West, a notion that Jesus being on his team meant everything, right? But now I don't want to identify so much with a Constantinian kind of Christianity, one that is where empire is upheld and where systems are, um, you know, as flawed as they are, um, are the end all be all. No, I want to identify with those who I'm serving at Lawndale. Those who live in Lawndale, West Garfield, East Garfield Park, Little Village in Austin whose life expectancy rate is low, whose city issues, recidivism, food deserts, and bad schools is real. I, I want to identify with them more now because I understand that their plight is mine. And so this talk comes out of just some of my reflections and being in, at Lawndale for the last year and a half. But before we get there, let me tell you about a little experiment I did. That's a church on the south side of Chicago. That's my friend's church. Uh, it's Bright Star Church of God in Christ on 44th and Cottage in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, in, the, in 2002, as a student at Moody, I, I've taught at Moody, but I also was a student at Moody. Um, uh, my best friend and I did a little experiment. We decided we were going to dress up like we were homeless and stand outside. You can't see it too well. You would stand outside this gate and ask people on a Sunday evening service if they would tell us about Jesus. So we stood outside the gate and we said, you know what? We, we, we threw some mud on our faces. We had some hair. I put a wig on my head. It was really bad. I mean, it's, it's kind of, I'm, I'm really embarrassed about it to do because I think that was not fair to those who are 
housing insecure. But still, R Ronnie and I um, dressed up like homeless men. And, men. And we waited. We tried to engage as many people that walked through that gate, kind of m melodramatically playing out Acts 3, the man at the gate called Beautiful, to see if anybody would tell us about Jesus. And do you know that they like literally stepped over us to get in the church? They didn't see us. They didn't engage us. So we got a little more irate. Ronnie started to, you know, get louder. He went over by the pastor's car, you know, and then that, ooh, I that got the attention of the members. Started calling out Pastor Peanut, because that was his childhood name, his brother. This is, you know, it's a family affair. <laughs> um, and, so, and so now the pastor had come out, and he recognized us and said, oh, they just, they're, I know them, it's okay. But it was a real timely lesson. Um, we had not told the pastor about it, um, but we were foolish enough to see what kind of reaction we would get. And um, I, I learned from this uh, scenario that we do what we do with people who's experience, what, who's, who experience this type of life every day uh, speaks volumes. Thankfully, you and I are part of clinics that seek to attend to this, but even we have, been, have to be reminded sometimes of the inestimable worth within the vid individual's that we serve. I mean, we can get familiar with it. Our ability to see others must not just come from altruistic expressions, but from the overflow of our love and value Jesus has placed in them. I mean, I've seen it in my church. I pastored a church in West Garfield Park and, 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 and filled with men and women who are coming out of something too. And, and, and being in the church for a little bit of a while longer, they began to have this partition of us versus them too, not seeing themselves and the people we served. It can happen. And I don't want to be naive enough to think that because we are CCHF, uh, that and where our work centers around those neighborhoods and communities that are disinherited, I, I, I think we can lose sight too sometimes. So what's visibility? The state of being able to see or be seen. The distance one can see as determined by light and weather conditions, right? How far you can see. We didn't see too well on our way in here yesterday because it was raining pretty hard in northern Indiana. And so, and so it was hard to see early in the morning. The degree to which something has attached general attention to or prominence. The issue began to lose its visibility. Do me a favor, um, pair up right where you are and um, name a few ways that we as humans might miss things that are in front of us. What are some of the ways, what are some of the things that we become, that become invisible to us uh, because of their familiarity? Could you just reach over to your neighbor, just talk to your neighbor for about two minutes? Well, what are some of the ways in which we might miss things that are right in front of us? Because it's familiar, we see it all the time. So, so what did you what did you come up with? I hear a lot. I hear a lot. Sounds like you guys are really centering on things you can't see or don't see in front of you. What did you What did you come up with? It's Brittany. They haven't garnished your car yet. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you, you may have piled up just enough clothes in your trunk. What if you're sleeping out of that car? That's and you're true. standing in the median, to, the median to get $30 to get something to eat. And somebody thinks just because they go see you get the pork that you don't need the money. So socioeconomic issues yeah. and status is not indicative of like, you know, where you are. You, it might be invisible what your condition, your condition's invisible. Yes. What your experience, someone else in the back, sir. Glasses on your head on top, you know, with the beard, like me. <laughs> we talked about um, the people that you see every day. Uh huh. Like even in families, in our families, um, mm. what's going on. Oh, sure. 
Yeah, like a child in front of you who's struggling and you're not aware because they, you see them, but you're not paying the small details. You're missing it. How might these issues, in essence, um, cause the familiar to be invisible to us? And it's very easy to happen. And, and, and guess what? It can happen in our clinics, even though we're doing a good job or trying our best to ensure that we don't miss anyone. But sometimes light, objects that don't reflect or observe light, absorb light, they can become invisible. We don't see things well, particularly because of the way in which certain colors absorb light. And that's probably the, le that's the more technical way. But a more uh, interesting way is I think about how camouflage is used, you know, blending in the background of something, right? If a, if a soldier was in this picture, I wouldn't know. You know, he's wearing fatigues. I'm, you know, he could be in there. Somebody could be in there. I, I'm not sure. So therefore, something like to help us understand is how prominent something sticks out. You know, prominence. And determining prominence in today's world is hard. Here's a couple of things. Um, in both cases, we simply overlook and might move right beyond the object. With no nefarious reasons in mind, it can happen to anyone. So, so then what makes items stand out? As I mentioned, prominence is the ability to have marketness and to see something as marked in front of you and uh, able to do something about it. Back in 2020, <clears throat> um, a colleague of mine at Moody, Dr. Craig Hendrickson, and I started a podcast on Moody Radio. And that, that was an election year, kind of like this one. <laughs> we sought to be agitative. And we created a whole series of podcasts that took on hot button electoral issues during an election year. One of them happened to be regarding health care. So we invited Michelle Warren from CCDA to be a part of our panel. And he and I interviewed her and we talked about Let's start here. Is, is health care, is it a socialist plot or is it a basic human right? We wanted to try to play both sides of the coin and see what it is. Now, you heard Dr. Zeke today, you know, take it up for her, but I, I do believe that it is a human right, that health is a human right. But in essence, our whole goal was to take and disrupt the red versus blue partisan politics to discover these quote unquote hot button issues. Any inequity in our systems. Paul Farmer notes that there exists a moral scandal of societies providing insufficient care for the poor while providing an overabundance of specialized care only for the affluent who can afford it. I want to ask and answer the question, how can we make the vulnerable visible? But first, uh, let's define who the vulnerable are according to scripture. There are examples that rise from the pages of the Old Testament and New Testament. And uh, I want to share with you those right now. The vulnerable, it seems like in the Old Testament, were those affected by fraudulent commerce and abuse. There's a litany of texts in the Old Testament. This, this whole page here just seems to really kind of identify those individuals, uh, those who are, uh, uh, lost their land, land, the hoarding of land, right? Those who were uh, taken into and, and put involved in dishonest courts broken justice systems, of uh, those who were subjected to violence of the ruling classes, uh, those who were subjected to uh, slavery, uh, those who were uh, subjected to unjust taxes, and those who were, un who were uh, subjected to unjust functionaries, uh, not to mention widows and women, right, and patriarchal societies. They were the most vulnerable. And those were the ones who were often looked over, left out, and to whom the prophetic material was addressing. We see a similarity in the New Testament, right? Although not as pronounced, but I, I think you do yourself a, pray, a favor by reading through particularly the book of Luke. Luke dubbed himself as a social, that Jesus was a social reformer uh, who came in order to, uh, to speak truth to power. Started off in Mary's prayer, you know, he dealt, with, he dealt with the way in which money was used and, and drew attention to all that. Those who were oppressed by the rich. The vulnerable in the New Testament, those oppressed by the rich. The indigent poor who face litigation. We look to the book of James. You know, we're getting dragged into court for being poor. Insult to injury. The ostracized because of their faith. 
These instances concretize the fact that the Bible not only denounces the exploitation of the vulnerable, but that Christians should actively um, prevent poverty from becoming established among the people of God. Do all that you can to prevent it for those, and let's expand it beyond the people of God, for everybody. But when have you heard sermons on these texts lately? So in many instances, we have the privilege to lean into these stories and re-familiarize ourselves uh, with who the vulnerable are and who the invisible are. Today, as you noted just now, it's hard for us to imagine and to think about uh, the invisible in front of us due to familiarity. But these are particularly hard to identify as well, the developmentally disabled, the intellectually disabled, the mentally disabled, gender minorities, women, racial minorities, immigrants, youth. I could keep going, but in all cases, we must create systems that address them as well and include them into our healthcare contexts. Here's another issue that I sense. This the commodification of medicine punishes the vulnerable here. Paul Farmer and Gustavo Gutierrez note that our work in our aligned clinics rises or falls with the reality that, quote, a truly committed quest for high quality care for the destitute sick starts from the perspective that health is a fundamental right. In other words, equitable access is the ability for individuals, family systems, and broader societal systems to utilize services, resources, information, power, and knowledge critical to self-determination and healthy development at all levels. We want to make sure that we are principled and ensuring that big pharma don't win, right? This is why I'm so grateful for the work at Lawndale and how we are able to provide access to medical, to, to medicine, if you will, that, that would normally be out of reach. People within marginalized groups often experience systemic barriers that undercut their ability to access the resources, knowledge, services, and power that would allow them greater control over their lives. So then, because CCHF aligned clinics are so kind of clued in to trying to overcome these things, we've got to keep that as part of our ongoing goals. We really, we really must, must do that. Now, this is real new for me, y'all. So, y'all, you know, I'm just, you just eavesdropping on an internal conversation up here. <laughs> That's all you are doing today. But I want to, but, I, but I, I do, I have now more <laughs> affinity towards this work and grateful for this work because of the 13 years I spent in West Garfield. A neighborhood very similar to Lawndale, if not worse where the stories of people who had inability to receive good quality care, surrounded by a metropolitan city that has the best medicine, some of the best practices and best healthcare systems in the, in the world, and yet they still could not have good healthcare. Our goal should continue to be to be a bridge of access to them. Okay. I love how Gutierrez and Farmer craft, in my estimation, a, a culture of visibility. They, they, really, they really sought to disrupt the way in which big systems and this medical commodification sought to forget about the most vulnerable. What both of them bring to their work of making the vulnerable visible is an inherent belief in understanding the reality of the poor we can more closely connect to the canonic incarnation of Jesus. What does that mean, Ernest? Well, Jesus came down in Philippians 2.7. Can I read it for you? And the reason why, apart from what your theology may be, and you're like, bro, why are you quoting so many, this Catholic guy, where's all the Protestants? I'm Big C Church. A little bit here. Big C Church. But listen to the kenosis, listen to the emptying of Jesus taking on the flesh and 
Philippians 2, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. My motivation and ours in making others visible is because Jesus did. This hasn't always been the case within some of our strains of Christianity. My experience sometimes in evangelicalism is to not look upon those or to take a perhaps some place some distance between us and them. But not in the work that we do. This is why your clinics are so uniquely placed to do this, to keep them visible. This is exactly why. Partnering with the poor reprioritizes who has access to the basic human right of health and how it's delivered. I wasn't thinking like this five years ago. But seeing what our providers are doing and how we are walking with men and women who would normally just be criminalized for their poverty or criminalized for their health or criminalized for their, uh, 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 for their need of recovery. We now have a chance to interrupt that and do what we can uh, to serve them. That sounds to me like an emptying of ourselves. An emptying of ourselves, a reprioritization to where we're not concerned so much about what the money we will make, but how, our li- how the, the, lives we will, the lives we will impact. So let me tell you a little bit about Paul Farmer. You probably already know who he is, but he's best known for his pioneering work in delivering community-based strategies that demonstrate the delivery of high quality health care and resource poor settings in the US and abroad, particularly Haiti. He's a co-founder and chief strategist of Partners in Health, known as the man who will cure the world. Unfortunately, he did, he did pass in 2022. But in that brief time, as an anthropologist and a, and a, and a physician, he, he put his money where his, he put his mouth where his, you know, he put his money where his mouth was. You, you know. Gustavo Gutierrez. And though he creates the option for the poor, the two of them align because they understand that this mission of making visible is what matters most. That Genus identifies himself preferentially with the poor, sorry for the errors there, those who are victims of injustice and with the oppressed, thus to follow Jesus is to follow in these footsteps. And I read it in the light of Matthew 25. I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, you didn't invite me in. I needed clothes, and you didn't clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. The reversal of this, the, the, the gotcha moment, right? In the, in the very, 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 very next text, and it's like, when? When do we do all that? He said, man, if you did it for any one of them, it was for me. He stands in solidarity with those he just identified. Aha! (laughs) I want to go back for just a moment and note that um, it's very easy, even in our work, to not to to not see what's in front of us. And and this is my submission to CCHF in this talk to remind you of these things that we've been doing for quite some time. Almost like a little prep rally an encouragement to continue this type of work because you get weary and well-doing, says Galatians, right? You get weary, you get tired, you get worn out. It's very easy. It's taxing. But in order to, to, you, you need a theological center for it, not just doing good for good's sake. You actually, this is why I want to supply you more, so I'm not a clinician, I'm a biblical theologian. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know anything but the text, the text, the text, the text. And if I can't anchor it to the text, then I don't have much to offer you. There are ways of reading scripture that want to, um, since the 11th century, Peter Lombard wants to systematize um, theology to make it neat and tidy, right? To make systems that work for you and me and to silo them and not, not make the Bible talk to itself. But what I would like to suggest to you and through the previous text and others I will recommend is that text, the text of scripture does give us a much more uh, tactile um, experience with God 
and what he cared about. The problem is in the West, we've become very, very comfortable. Another issue is the aesthetics of beauty. I remember preaching a sermon from Acts chapter 6 about the overlooking of widows in my church and um, those who were right in front of us. A few moments ago I mentioned that in my church, because we have a food pantry, uh, we got, I, one of my deacons got complained against because he was treating them harshly. These were men and women from the neighborhood who already didn't have much. And I got word of it and I had to chide him because I did not, neither did they appreciate that injurious kind of conversation. You can't talk down to people who don't have much, man. But we in the West, we tend to, you know, we give, we throw money at things that look good. We like things that look good. If it's not much to look at, if we don't know how to look at it, if it's, if it's offensive if we look that way, if we, we, we tend to just scurry against the wall like a mouse. Don't see me, don't see me. Don't see me, don't see me. <laughs> and that can happen in the church too. It's very easy to happen in the church as well. And continuing on, um, Let's then move from identifying the dilemma toward um, addressing how do we make others visible. How about we start with some honesty first? Um, Jesus came to those who were arguably less beautiful by society standards, but because they, because they were viewed as the sum total of their actions, not the image of God that they possess. Well, let me slow that down for just a second and just say this, that sometimes we tend to evaluate people based upon the sum total of their choices that have put them in that place. If you'd only stop smoking dope, you know, if you only put the bottle down, if you only, you know, may, maybe, maybe life will be different for you. Instead of starting with identifying the icon, the image, that they, that they have there from birth. A few of those many pastors that are at our, at our clinic uh, we went up to one of the uh, shelters on the north side to, that's been housing Venezuelan migrants. They couldn't take in a bunch of them, but we took, they took in um, several, several men uh, at a church, Southern Baptist Church on the north side of Chicago. And um, as I walked through the facilities, I was just so impressed by how dignified they were. Not every shelter uh, is <laughs> made the same way. Can I get a witness? Yeah. Not all shelters are built the same way. But this one, man, oh, man, it was dignified. It added dignity to those who were displaced, making it through the Darien Gap, you know, fighting their way to get here. And now they were starting anew politics aside, and to see that they have been doing that because they felt compelled to do so. So we must always see the godness. I made, that's not a typo. <laughs> the godness in the individual in order to keep them visible. That's one way. I mean, I'm just, this, just a suggestion, right? Because men and women come in so many different shapes and sizes. One, 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 one more quick uh, anecdote. Um, there was a grad student at my school who um, had graduated and he was uh, experiencing homelessness, living out of his van. And one of my buddies called me up and said, hey man, uh, so-and-so is coming through town. Can you, um, can you put him up for a night? I said, yeah, it's cool. My family was out of town. And um, I, re I didn't remember much, but I remember that he had a, a, a visible birthmark on his face that caused his face to be um, a little bit disproportionately configured. But I enjoyed his fellowship so much. I, I could only imagine what he went through in his life, having had the physicality. We sometimes get so caught up on the outward appearance and we miss the godness inside of them. And what you're challenged, I'm challenged to do is to see that part of them 
and to make them visible. Not camouflaged, you know, not, not you know, uh, invisible, but to make them visible. What can we do? We can round up the less familiar texts of Scripture and read them regularly and holistically. Oh, what do you mean, Ernest? Well, the Katina of the prophets, they, they really want to identify uh, the, 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 the castaways, those who were um, vulnerable. Maybe if we spent less time in the Psalms and maybe read through Amos every now and then or Hosea, we might be more familiar with these texts. These are lesser known texts because we go to our, our favorites, you know. There's nothing wrong with that. But it's making sure that those texts of Scripture that are less in rotation are regularly reflected upon. The visibility of others stems from the Bible that ascribes their worth, right? The Bible, this theology of healthcare justice is to see the Bible is already inherently place worth in them. Listen to the Psalter. Blessed is the one who considers the poor, 41.1, 72.12, for he delivers the needy when he calls and the poor and whom he has and whom has no helper, him who has no helper. Proverbs 14.21, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Right? We don't, we don't necessarily spend a lot of time there because that doesn't do nothing for you as an individual. It makes a claim on you. It demands some action from you. These are not just token texts, but truths with centrifugal force. Why don't you memorialize them in your clinic? <laughs> Can't see that too well. Look there, Bruce. Bruce. We have these scripture cards. Um, memorialize them around your, your clinic. And I'm not talking about the, but the less popular ones, the ones that are just continuing to uh, speak truth to the, to the plight of the oppressed. The overlook, you know, the ones you serve, <laughs> those. Remind them, put, put the scriptures in front of them, put them out in front of you so that you see that this is your grounding. Not because of any guilt or the sense of altruism, or I just want to be, you know, I just want to do good. And I know that's, that's great, but that's going to get tired after a while. You're going to get worn out if you're just doing it for that sake. You, you need some foundation, you need an anchor. You need an anchor. Um, share more lessons from the New Testament Catholic letters. What do you mean by that? I used to teach the Catholic letters at Moody, right? Love this book, Hebrews to Revelation. Be because they place a premium upon life in the early church and interactions between individuals, read them again. James, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, they are all dealing with how to Deal with men and women and, that are trying to make it in a Roman imperial society. And they're banding together as a people. Man, go back to those texts. Read James afresh. Spend less time in Paul. Spend less time in the Gospels. Yep, I said it. <laughs> Spend a little less time in those favorites of yours and go to the less the ones in less rotation. They're chock full of human interactions that are timeless. You read them, you sound, they feel as though they are actually occurring today, right? Peter says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal you're going through, the testing of your faith. That proves you in it, you know? You're going through something. I'm telling my brother this today. Man, imagine, you know, life, Sometimes for us, it seems as though that we want to box with the Lord because we're like, God, I'm on your side. What's, what's going on here? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm on your team. Why, why is this so complicated? Why is this so hard? I'm, I'm doing your work. I just <laughs> but indeed, these are encouraging texts that you and I can just revisit and be the motivation uh, for your service making the vulnerable visible. What are some ways that you can address the vulnerable and visible within your clinics? Why don't you take two or three more minutes and think about brainstorm. I, I threw out a couple of suggestions. I said, hey, put some scriptures out there. Memorialize them around your clinic. You know, 
reflect upon them in your devotionals. Invite your chaplain. Hey, Tress. Hello, is it Angie? Margie. Uh, ask your chaplains and your spiritual care directors to uh, write lessons on the lesser known texts that center the human experience and those that your patients are encountering. What else? Take two to three minutes and partner up. Think of some ideas. What can you do in your clinics to increase the visibility of the vulnerable? You can continue to add to this. Let me, let me give you a couple more and then our time will be done today. But it, it, it remains true that you and I need to continue to destigmatize stigmatize mental health, work with your local churches to identify families most in need or perhaps are not too, they don't have the fortitude to speak up for themselves, dignify the living arrangements for housing insecure and the migrants who we encounter if we're working with the unhoused. Have courageous conversations within your clinic space to identify those who have not, we have not paid attention to. These are just the starting points for some of these ongoing conversations. And I get it. I can hear you through your stairs. Gray, we're doing some of this work. Well, then keep doing it. <laughs> Don't stop. But if you get tired, I want to suggest that you return to the scriptures. One of the reasons why you're tired is because you have... Maybe you're like me and you've grown up in an individual application of the text and not a collectivist text. What do you mean by that? This Bible was written to you individually, but it also addresses all of us at the same time. In other words, it's, it's holding us all accountable. Its main points are meant to help communities like the ones we serve to be better. I leave you with this. Um, years later, uh, pastor of Bright Star Church of God in Christ, I don't think I had anything to do with this, but they have one of the most dynamic community outreach programs in the city of Chicago. It had nothing to do with me and his brother, uh, the senior pastor's brother, dressing up like homeless and asking somebody to tell us about Jesus. But now their group, their outreach, serves so many people, has become a model for the city of Chicago. Over the course of their 12-year history, Bright Star Community Outreach has made significant contributions to the renewal of Chicago's most vulnerable communities. As a 501c3 organization, driven by their hope for change in this city, and the families that call it home, Bright Star's presence have been marked by effective ministries programming, social development, and advocacy, particularly third and fourth wards of Chicago, Bronzeville. And uh, they're, they're, they're doing the work because the Lord has called them to do so. They're addressing the poor economic opportunities, inadequate mental health services, homelessness, child safety, and drug abuse. These efforts are designed to strengthen local families and communities, as well as leverage our partnerships with the organizations and businesses that share our passion for seeing the renewal of Chicago. I could have shared, I could have shared uh, Lawndale's. But I figured I'd share somebody else's. You already know our story. And you know how, uh, how embedded our ministry has been in our west side of Chicago neighborhood. But here's another one. One that I didn't think about when I was there dressing up as a homeless person, begging them to tell me about Jesus. But one that I can now see and say that the Lord has used them to make the vulnerable, the invisible, make them visible again and to see that their, care, their needs are being met as well. Keep doing that good work. Thank you for your time today. I'm open for any kind of questions. They have to be about the scriptures because I don't know anything clinical, so don't go anything. I know my, I know my lane. I know where I'm, I know where I'm at.